It was April. It had been a year and a half since a major life upset had sent me in a new direction. I kept my condo in Fort Worth, but I was working and getting energy and passion during the week at a job in Austin. And I started doing some self-growth things. Things like slow pitch softball, improv, writing, poetry, acting. And some of my friends must have thought that my joy was spilling too much because Marty said to me, Trevor, you're an idiot. You need to audition for TRF. And I said, what's a TRF? She said, I'm in the performance company for the Texas Renaissance Festival and your energy would sort of fit. <laughs> so I auditioned, my first ever audition. And I did a good job, I thought. The director said, we'll contact you in two weeks. Well, it was June, two months later. And I'd really forgotten about the audition because I had no idea what being in the performance company at TRF would entail. And then the director called. He had given me a job of an actual real 16th century person. And I had a lot of research to do. I had some costumes to build. And I had to learn how to affect a fake English accent. My energy was high because I was going to tap into more of my creativity. Then it was October and the first weekend at TRF was over. And it was the, the two months of rehearsals were just gone in a blink. And I didn't understand what had happened, but I had a life-changing experience in creating this character that was for street theater. And it was amazing. And Oh, after the first weekend, I got back to my office. I sat down, my feet hurt, my body ached, my voice was hoarse, and I couldn't drop the English accent. <laughs> <laughs> so then it was November, and the end of the season for the, my first season of TRF was over. And I was invited on the last day of the last weekend to an event at a restaurant where the performance company and the vendors all got together and celebrated the season. And I'd just spent four months with performers who'd seen me in everything, and I had spent two months with vendors who'd only ever seen me in costume. So when I walked in in my civvies, people didn't recognize me. And I felt like, well, I learned a whole bunch of new people that day, it was great. And then one of my performance company friends came over, stuck a gummy bear on my forehead. What do you do with gummy bears? You stick them in your mouth. I did, and she was angry at me. She said, you need to keep it on your forehead. And I looked around, and there was everybody had a gummy on their forehead. I was like, here's an opportunity. <laughs> so I started stealing them and eating them. And after a little while, people cottoned on to this, and it became a little bit of a game. And I chased a few people, but I got them all. It was a win. Well, until I had all that gelatin and sugar in my stomach, that wasn't much of a win. Well, finally there were two holdouts, and they were both in costume, so I didn't recognize them from fair at all. But the shorter one was easy. I got her gummy bear in no time at all. The taller one, the game was on, and we flirted and chased each other around that room for quite a while until finally we were face to face. And she reaches up and she grabs that with a twinkle in her eye. Let me just say, I got it. <laughs> it was mine. Now it's next May and I'm at Scarborough Fair Renaissance Festival near Fort Worth and I'm with my daughter and we're spending the day there. We're at the bottom of Crown Meadow watching the back of a show where there was a lot of noise. And it was interesting, but for some reason I was compelled to turn and look to my right. I did. And I saw a group of people leaving to move over to another side of the festival, but somebody stood out and our eyes connected and I was transfixed. I was rooted to the ground and all my molecules were rearranged. It was like we were looking into each other's souls through our eyes. And then Sawyer grabbed me on the arm and said, Dad, can we eat? And that moment was gone. And I turned around and I couldn't remember anything that she was other than she was tall and blonde. I couldn't remember if she was in civvies or a costume, what friends she had. 
and I really lost that moment. I tried to rearrange my molecules, but they were permanently changed. Sora and I stopped for lunch, and she was happy to share with me all the things she wanted to do all that afternoon. So we went shopping, we watched a few shows, we snacked, and we people watched. And I looked for those eyes, those eyes, and I couldn't find them anywhere. And for several months following that, I obsessed about this mystery woman. And after a while, it just became hopeless. And she was put in a room which said, the woman of my dreams. Now, it's August again, and I'm on my second year of, of te Texas Renaissance Festival rehearsals. And I turn up, and nobody's got their costume, so we're all pretty much casual. Two girls come in and said, Trevor, where's Melissa? I don't know how they knew me, but they knew everybody. And I knew Melissa was out for dinner, so they said, can we sit and chat until Melissa comes back? So we did, and I made two new friends. It turned out they were sisters, they worked at the German beer booth, and they had a great time with the performance company. They knew everybody. And so then when Melissa came back, the older sister went off with her, and the younger sister, Dee, sat with me and we talked, and we talked. And we discovered that we had so much in common, our favorite books, our favorite music, films, food, and chai tea. And we got along extremely well. The next weekend at rehearsals, it was gonna be below zero, and Dee and her sister were going to be sleeping in their car, and it was gonna be so cold there. So I said, I've got a big mattress that I shouldn't have bought in my tent, and we're near the campfire, bring your bedding, and we'll all be warm. And they did. Somewhere in the middle of the night, Dee rolled over and put her head right on my shoulder. And I put my arm around her, and we slept like that that night and the next night until we had to leave and go back to our day jobs and to our non-fair life. And then it was the next year, and it was February, and it was my birthday, and we had cake, and Dee dumped me. I was like, wait, Tish. <laughs> Why did I bring up Tish? Because one of the times that we were together and talking, we arrived at the festival at the same time, I had been listening to Tish Hinojosa, Dreaming from the Labyrinth, an amazing and an absolutely incredible, incredible, it was, it was recorded in a, uh, an abandoned cathedral in San Antonio and the acoustics were spectacular. And she said, let's go catch, get some groceries and I've got somebody that I want to share with you in the car. So she pressed the button on a CD and it was Tish Hinojosa, Edge of a Dream. And that's when I thought I'd fallen for her. Well, we sat outside of fair hours and we talked and talked and talked. And I said, hang on a minute. In the reflection in her eyes of the fire, I could see this sparkle. And I said, were you the woman that I took the gummy bear from last November? And her eyes lit up and that twinkle was, yep, she was that one. And then for a moment I realized in my soul and I said, were you on Crown Meadow in May and your eyes met with somebody across the field in a very surreal moment? And her eyes lit up wide and she said, that was you? I had found my mystery woman. Dee was my mystery woman. And from that moment we were inseparable and all was right in the world. It was only then after February that she dumped me. And I didn't understand that. I drove home in a daze and I couldn't understand. I didn't find an answer anywhere. And then in March, about three weeks later, I wrote her a handwritten letter, pouring out all my feelings, trying to solve the problem of what happened. And I don't remember her exact words in the letter that she sent back, but I do remember the concept of what happened. And she said, it's not our time and you need to never contact me again. And then comes August and I'm not in the TRF rehearsals this year. And I'm quite happy to be on my own while my heart is healing and getting through all of that. And I just had one thing, what if I see her again? How will I feel? What will I think? How will I react? 
And then it comes October and TRF starts and I'm a patron and I'm in my jeans and T-shirt and I have no performance company responsibilities. And I walk in and I'm just standing there taking in the ambiance and the atmosphere and wallowing in that. And I was having this very long meditative moment and I felt a tap on my shoulder. And I turned around and it was D. And she looked at me and she said, we had a tiff. And then she reached up and she hugged me hard. And I mumbled agreement. And then when the embrace was over, I stepped back and I said, can we talk? And we found the coffee shop. And over a chai tea, we talked and talked. We agreed that our connection was something unbelievable. We agreed that we got along famously. And my heart healed and grew stronger as we found our new place. We parted as friends and all was right in the world. Yeah.